My name is Ruth York. I'm going to save um, my slightly longer introduction um, until we start talking in a minute, but I'm with Families and Youth of Idaho. We're a statewide family support organization for youth and adolescents with serious emotional disturbance disorders. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jason Sellis, and I'm the executive director of Sellis Recovery. We're an outpatient treatment center here in Meridian. We specialize in addictive and mental health disorders. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We are going to go ahead and dive right into this presentation today. So Jason and Ruth, I know you just introduced yourselves, but I'll let you give a little bit more of a robust introduction, and I will pull up your slides if you just want to tell me when to advance. Okay, uh, as the first slide comes up, I'll get started telling you again, Ruth York, Executive Director of Families and Youth of Idaho. We go by FY Idaho. Um, we used to be known as the Idaho Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. That is still our legal nonprofit name. We um, do business as Families and Youth of Idaho, mostly so we don't share the initials IFF with another Idaho organization who we are strongly opposed to. And I will stop there. Um, <laughs> so FY Idaho is what's called a family run nonprofit. That's like a federal designation um, for non, a nonprofit that um, is funded with some federal dollars to support the families of youth who have SED or serious emotional disturbance. Again, it's sort of a, a federal categorization there. Um, and so we provide support, advocacy, and education to families who are seeking mental health supports uh, for their children. We are non clinical. Uh, occasionally, we offer some clinical support groups run by a clinician, um, but our staff um, and our board, uh, the criteria for being staff and board is that the majority of us are family members of uh, youth who have needed mental health services, um, especially in the current system of care, the YES system or Youth Empowerment Services. As such, uh, we also work with families who are dealing with some substance abuse issues. Um, and then I'll go to you, Jason, and then we'll take off from there. Sounds good. Well, again, my name is Jason Zellis, and I'm the executive director in LCSW with Zellis Recovery. We started in 2016. We do uh, day treatments, PHP services, as well as intensive outpatient services and general outpatient services for both adolescents and adults with substance use disorders, as well as co-occurring mental health disorders. Um, we, let's see, have a couple of psychiatric nurse practitioners on staff, as well as six therapists and uh, four administrative staff. So we're a smaller office of around 12 people. Um, my background, uh, one of the things I was excited about with this presentation is I've been involved in some multi-systemic family intensive outpatient groups for several years in direct service. And one of the things I've been pretty passionate about is working with families, you know, who have adolescents who are in active addiction. And so th this is a, a topic that I feel pretty strongly about. Let's kick us off, Shannon. Yeah. So with the perspectives on addiction, when, when Ruth and I talked, we, we decided on how addiction impacts the whole families. I think for today's presentation, we're gonna be talking a lot more about parents um, rather than like the siblings, but no doubt siblings are obviously affected by addiction as well. Uh, families can be an important part of the recovery and the healing process, both for adolescents as well as themselves. Um, addiction and recovery are not well understood outside of therapeutic and recovery communities. And I would say to various degrees, it's not even understood in recovery communities. You know, so you could go to different uh, support groups, for example, that have totally different outlooks as far as what addiction is and what it's not. Uh, awareness and education are needed across Idaho, and we'll spend definitely a fair amount of time talking about that. So the first slide, uh, Shannon, if you could go to this 
I, I wanted to talk about this parallel process of addiction. And what I mean by that is um, through working with family members, a lot of times what I see is that if an adolescent is starting off in active addiction, usually, and it's, it's obviously this is not always the case, but if an adolescent is really minimizing their use, you know, and saying things like I'm only using on weekends or we're out of school or you know, what, it's only marijuana or what, whatever the case may be, usually other people in their lives are also doing the same. And so some of this is a little bit of what I would call innocent enabling, you know, of looking the other way. I know I talk with a lot of parents that after they get off work, the last thing they want to do is argue with their kid about why they're smelling what they're smelling and having their kids deflect and gaslight them and tell them they're crazy, et cetera. And so usually with rationalizing, minimizing, compartmentalizing, I oftentimes see this parallel process that the adolescents and parents are kind of going through the same thing. And I don't know if anybody else has experience with this, but I, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts in the chat if you do. Um, the when adolescents start having consequences of their addiction, but this is where um, usually it's external consequences that people are seeing first. Now, some of the things that we see by the time people are brought into treatment, which is, I, I'm gonna say a lot of the times people have done individual counseling, family counseling, before they actually come into a treatment program, just in a very general sense. But when, when I have people come in, usually they've had some problems at school. Uh, and, and this can be multiple problems. Same thing with engagement in the legal system. Um, I was talking with a young man earlier about um, who was telling me and, and this is a pretty charming young man, uh, well-adjusted socially, good interaction skills, et cetera. And he was telling me he had been busted for shoplifting alcohol six times and the police were never even called. And the parents knew about one of the times. And, you know, I, I find that, that sometimes that this happens where adolescents, they, they start getting consequences, but they don't see them as consequences. And so what ends up happening is they start piling up. And when they start piling up, we start getting a sense that things aren't as manageable as what they may appear. And usually you, you see the switch with parents where a lot of times parents try to fix, manage, punish, or reward, right? So this is where grounding comes into play. This is where parents are now seeing what their kids are doing, saying it's not okay, trying to put in place, I don't know, rules and consequences, all those sorts of things. And what happens is uh, that they're trying to rationalize and understand with their, their son or daughter. And the son or daughter is not using because of any kind of rational or logical reasons. In other words, usually, you know, when you think about the adolescent brain, it's not fully developed. You know, the emotional part of the brain is much more stimulated and the likelihood of them making impulsive decisions are, are probably greater in a very general sense, even without addiction. And so then you, you throw in substances where all of a sudden, you know, someone feels like they found their calling in life, you know, where they find that they, they have a sense of belonging with their peers and all these things that they've been looking for and trying to argue with that, um, which is a lot of times what, what parents, you know, professionals and, and just people out in the community try to do uh, is not very effective. So, so what we see is parents, but the more they're trying to control the out of control behavior, the more they're seeing it's out of control and the more things get out of control for themselves, meaning, you know, if, if, if you're married and, and you're spending every waking moment uh, talking with your husband or your wife about, you know, what to do about this out of control behavior, all of a sudden that out of control behavior is controlling your marriage, 
And I, I've seen a lot of um, parents that get caught up in this for years because th this goes into adulthood as well. So finally, when an adolescent actually accepts help, that this is where a recovery process can start to take place. Usually we see that, that parents uh, start being able to detach emotionally and start putting in place rules, consequences, et cetera, allowing their adolescents to be accountable for their own behavior. And then the parents themselves find recovery. And this can look different from person to person, but in a very general sense, what, what we see is oftentimes, if you think about a uh, first step of a 12 step program is admitting powerlessness over a substance and that your life has become unmanageable. And usually when that's happening, other people, at least on an unconscious level are saying, I'm powerless over my kids' use, and it's actually making my life unmanageable. Now, the key is, is figuring out how that's a first step in recovery and not just a first step in or another step into more hopelessness. And so let, let's go to this next slide, Shannon. So I'm going to pop in here um, and uh, Keep in mind the the bullets uh, on the left on the right side of what Jason just presented. That's what I have here in in my bullets, and I'm just going to bring more um, a little more personalized for you. I think a little more of that parent piece here. Um, you know, first off, been there, done that, um, really, and and know plenty of other people who have. I, I love Jason's presentation there because I just think it represents this so well. Uh, there is this level of parent denial and rationalization, as he spoke to. So it comes off as, well, my kid's too young to have a substance use disorder, right? I mean, we're not going to peg that on a, on a teen, for heaven's sakes. Um, and so it's like not even in your real wheelhouse of possibilities sometime. You know, my kid's just experimenting. I'm sure they can control it when they decide to control it, or better yet, I will control it when I decide to get serious with them. Because I was a kid and I partied too, and I'm okay now, if they are in fact okay now. Um, and there's just a lot of rationalizing this to typical teenage behavior. Um, and then as we go to that second piece of, so I'll fix, manage, punish, or reward this, that's that piece of, I just need to get serious. So I'll find a way to make my kid do that. Um, they're grounded and they won't like that. Um, there's ways I can motivate them to change their uh, behavior through punishment and reward. Um, but the reality is, and Jason's going to speak more to this uh, in a little bit, uh, there's not because they're having a separate journey that has to do with what's happening in their brain, um, separate to what we think. Um, we can make happen for them and the brain that we think we're still dealing with in this adolescent, um, which has changed when substance use disorders come online. And then uh, that piece where the parent does need to accept the accountability and recovery for, you know what, I'm not in control here. I have to, have, I have to find my own journey with this, but my journey is, um, is a whole separate journey than the journey of my kid. So my journey cannot necessarily predict the outcome of my kid's journey, but it sure can help my own outcome. And that's what I need to be focused on. And, and it can help my kid's journey, but parents need to focus on their piece, that piece they can control. Um, as Jason says, life has become very unmanageable. Um, and it sneaks up on us. And then one day we realize, my Lord, this this whole thing is controlling our lives, um, as he said. So um, I'll leave it there and let Jason go into his next set. If you'll do the next slide, Shannon. Thanks. So with the parallel process of addiction, I believe there's also a parallel process of recovery. And so a lot of the recovery principles, especially in early recovery, I believe are somewhat counterintuitive. In other words, um, you know, when, when I'm seeing an adolescent that's telling me that using is the solution to their problems, 
you know, it's very counterintuitive to do anything different. And for a lot of parents, you know, ed- admitting any kind of um, defeat or that, that their kid's behavior is even irrational is at least on some level counterintuitive as well. So, so when an adolescent gets in recovery, um, a lot of, re- when you think about recovery programs and, and how they differ from uh, just traditional counseling, I think one of, one of the big differences is that in treatment, people are asked to change behavior so that the thinking slowly changes. And you're hopefully seeing them enough where you're helping people engage in these behavioral changes. And with adolescents, a lot of times, this getting active in recovery, um, you know, to be calling other people for support, for asking for help, these kind of things don't typically come natural for most people, let alone for adolescents. And I think parents go through a very similar process. And the one of the things that we see in the groups is usually um, if parents are starting to know that, uh, I'll just take a husband and a wife, where the wife says, you know what, I can't just go back and forth with my husband about this every single day when they finally are able to actually call like another mom in the group and talk, okay, I'm not even saying fix anything or anything like that. Those kind of things are are difficult. And for adolescents, they are as well. And so I know like most adolescents are not gonna call someone for support or for help unless they're calling that person anyway. Uh, meaning like if they're not already engaged with that person and talking and in regular communication, they're not going to just all of a sudden start calling when they're feeling really depressed or whether they're wanting to use or they're having a craving. And parents probably are the same. I know I'm not going to randomly just start calling someone when I need it unless I'm really talking to them otherwise. And so, so I, I, I talked earlier about this powerlessness and manageability concept with uh, adolescents and how parents go through this as well. And so usually when, when a parent is able to emotionally detach from this behavior, they start on their own process of recovery. For some parents, it's a formal process, meaning they, they'll join like Al-Anon programs. Uh, they'll work, they'll get sponsors themselves. Um, And for for other people, it may not look like that. But accepting help, I believe, is something that most people don't just normally do. Having said that, when you start to see adolescents doing it, oftentimes we see parents doing it as well and vice versa. And so this is another thing where I'd love to hear other people's feedback about this. Um, again, talking more about parents that aren't, you know, an active addiction themselves. I think that takes a totally different spin on things. But for, for most everyday parents out, out in the world, I think usually they go through this parallel process with early recovery as well. And so focusing on one's own recovery and strengths and the entire family unit Um, One of the things that's interesting that we do in our our family group is once a week, adolescents do these weekly evaluations of their behavior. And whenever you see a parent that wants to start trying to lecture their kid about something, you'll see this like glazed look over their face. And, you know, everything that I've learned about like effective communication where you know, if a parent starts raising their voice or getting more animated or talking faster, it's usually because they're not feeling heard themselves. And usually it's because they're not feeling, they're not heard. And so the adolescent is totally tuning them out and having, having parents actually cease doing that and doing something different and being able to re I don't know, uh, say, you know, Johnny, you, um, 
I don't know, earn a negative week because of whatever and, and you're grounded or lose phone privileges for a period of time, et cetera, and then just stick to that is usually not a very natural process. Usually we want to explain, don't you know what this is doing? And you can have your phone if you just did X, Y, Z. And that stuff just does not work. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Shannon. So I am um, the classic over explainer in really all walks of life and definitely in parenting. <laughs> so I can completely relate to what uh, Jason is talking about there. So again, I'm going off of his bullets um, when a parent gets in active recovery. So that's us as parents realizing that this is bigger. This is bigger than me. Um, and this is bigger than my kid. And we need help. Um, and that's hard and humbling, um, slow to come through a lot. I think we think we're parents. We have minors. We're responsible for everything about that minor. We need to be in charge of everything related to that minor and certainly everything related to their safety and well-being. So it is a terrible feeling when you um, feel like uh, that's not true in your life. And that's that piece of powerlessness that really takes a while to embrace. Um, in my experience and in, uh, in, in watching others. So you realize you, I can't change my child's behavior. Nothing I'm doing is working. Um, we need help. And it's both, I don't think you realize at first when you're uh, seeking help, at least I, I can speak to, I really thought my child needs help. Um, I, I wasn't aware of the parallel process until one of the therapists involved in, um, in our family's care, literally handed me a book called The Parallel Process. Um, it had to do with uh, mental health more than substance use disorders at the time, but I was kind of taken aback. Whoa, whoa, wait, what do you mean? Like, you're thinking I'm a cause here? I have work to do? And I just admit that because it's hard. Um, it's really hard to admit that to yourself, but when you understand why it's true, why there's a parent, where, why there's a parallel process and the youth has one process and the parent family has the other, then it's so much easier to embrace. So going to bullet number two, we can more admit our powerlessness that we have our own journey. And um, as I said before, our outcome is not necessarily our youth's outcome. Um, and, and vice versa. Um, and, and that can be true. You know, we're not always in sync on our journeys. Um, and that can be hard, but um, I'll, I'll wait a little to get to this piece. I think it's better for a, a later slide, but it becomes so important because you can't control your youth's journey that you do control yours. So no matter where they are in theirs, you're holding on to what you can control in yours. It makes a huge difference um, to the ride that you are having, the journey you are having um, as your youth um, has their journey. So um, stay, parents accepting help, staying focused on my parallel process or the family's parallel process is about our own recovery. I like some of the things Jason mentioned. Um, I worked with Al-Anon for a while and just found it so helpful in reminding me, this is your piece. This is the piece that you're working on. Um, oh, you, it sounds like you're sliding over there. That's that's not yours over here. Come back over here. That was really helpful to me. Um, there is a lot of isolation in this journey um, for parents. Jason spoke to... Um, parents are not always sharing and reaching out for help and support because we feel shame and blame. Um, sometimes you, you really get those messages from the community. We can talk about that in a little bit too. And that's something I'd sure like to change. But there's our, our internal barometer um, of ourselves where we're not measuring up to our own expectations of, the, of our parenting and of who our children are. 
Um, so that's very difficult and, and we isolate as a result of it because we don't always want people to know what's happening because we're projecting that even people who might not shame and blame us could shame and blame us and we want to avoid that. Um, yeah, I think that's it for here and we'll um, go on to the next slide, Shannon. So this is, so this is uh, families are an important part of the recovery process and parents follow a similar path of recovery as the, the adolescent or child. But the one thing I would say here though is that parents can be active in recovery themselves even if their kids aren't. And in other words, um, we're talking about this parallel process where oftentimes you, you see one following a path in recovery and then so is the other, but that's not necessarily always the case. And so one, one of the things is that usually where parents are breaking the denial, and I'm talking about their own denial, so of, of either looking the other way or minimizing the type of drugs that their adolescent is doing or that they're doing it only at certain places or only at certain times or because they're still active in soccer, that that, that makes it okay. Um, and then others, it's as simple as uh, avoidance, you know, of being tired after work and not wanting to get into this stuff. But when parents are actually able to break that denial and coming to the reality of the situation, usually adolescence, it, it kind of bursts the bubble at least a little bit as far as the denial is concerned. So when you read like really old addiction literature, people talked a lot about how people need to hit rock bottom to get sober. And really what they were talking about at that time was that people had to see themselves in at least to a various degree, a psychological crisis if they are willing to get help. In other words, usually something had to be going on. And um, I, I don't interact with uh, inter interventionists very often, but um, they used to be far more prevalent uh, a decade or two ago. And I, I, and I don't know if people have watched like those intervention TV shows, that sort of thing, but the amount of time that goes into working with family members to set boundaries and sticking to it is, is oftentimes uh, a process all in of itself. You know, for any, any parent to say, you know, you need to get help today, but if you don't, I'm no longer willing for you to stay in our home or something like that. But those are, those are things that um, are usually pretty difficult for parents to actually come to grips with. But by admitting defeat and powerlessness, they, they, they can't fix or save their child. And this is really, really hard stuff. Um, it, you know, with younger adults, um, if, if you see uh, a younger adult who has been stealing from their parents, has been in and out of legal trouble, in and out of rehabs, uh, in and out of uh, jails, and, and parents finally get to a point where they can no longer have them in their home. When, when that person finally calls them and they say, you know, I have nowhere to go, I'm, you know, sleeping at the park or some, something like that, um, it's very, very hard to distinguish when you're helping your child versus enabling. And I, I just, any parent that's in these kind of situations, I'd encourage them not to do this alone. Be talking with other people, get feedback, get professional help, because this, this stuff is uh, traumatizing all in of itself. And so when, when parents are admitting that they can't just do this on their own, then there starts being allowing professionals, maybe support group programs to intervene in their child's recovery while they keep the focus on themselves as well. And so finding their own recovery, regardless of their child's success with recovery, is uh, um, it, it's just really critical. And I don't want that point to get lost as we're talking about this 
parallel with uh, both addiction and recovery because it's it's obviously not necessary that for a parent to recover that the adolescent has to. So let's go ahead and move to that next slide. Uh, Jason, can I just pop oh, go in ahead. On, on yeah, Jason, sorry. Can leave it here for just a sec because um, Jason just said some things that I want to um, just speak to a little more. Um, rock bottom. I can't even tell you how many times I feel like, well, surely this is the bottom because it feels like my bottom. But my child may have a very different bottom than I have. And so I've become prepared <laughs> in life that um, I have to deal with the fact that the capacity my youth may have for um, sort of what seems like disaster in life, dysfunctionality in life um, is very different than my own. Um, so rock bottom uh, moves around, it seems for me. And the boundaries piece is so vital what Jason was saying, because no matter how good your boundaries are, it doesn't mean you're going to harden your heart to the fact that this is your child and they are in an extremely difficult, sometimes terrifying journey, terrifying to you, the parent. Um, and uh, there are people on this call who know very well that me personally, I continue to struggle with boundaries. Um, it is like this constant thing. It's not like one day I figure out my boundary and I am good. It, it doesn't work like that. It's this constant process of, okay, this is what I'm up against now. What is my proper boundary that's going to serve my life? And I have finally, it's taken me a lot of years, come around to that piece of realizing that the boundaries that serve my life are usually really very much the boundaries that will serve my youth's life. Um, and that's that piece between, that's that piece of not enabling. And because I'm so fearful of letting my child fall too far, I want to come in and put some safety net under there that doesn't allow him to take the fall that he needs to hit his bottom so that they can then pick themselves up and say, you know, there's learning for them in that, right? Just because I'm sick of the way we're living doesn't mean that my child is sick of the way that they are living. And they may not be ready until they have some really, really tough times that they experience that have more consequences to their lives. And so uh, I really spent uh, uh, too, way too much time um, accommodating my child too much protecting them from what was the terrifying fall. And of course, the, the most terrifying thing is that your, your child is going to lose their life because there is true morbidity and mortality associated with this. Um, and th that I think is the most difficult part of the parent recovery journey is just staying in there and feeling the feelings you have for the compassion, the love you have for this child, while balancing it with the boundaries that are going to enable your life to continue in a healthy, successful way. And that's also and being able to put the lens on it that says that's actually what's going to help my child the most. Um, and hearing it, it may not seem like, well, come on, duh, that's, that should be easy to understand. When it hits your home and your life, it's really, really hard. I think Jason did a good job explaining that. And I just wanted to expound upon that a little more. Um, and Shannon, you can go to the next slide now. Yeah, so addiction and recovery not being well understood outside of therapeutic and recovery communities. Um, addiction for addition education for the entire family. Um, you know, I, I've one thing that I've thought about working with both adolescents and young adults is I, I've seen um, the 17 year old who is in denial and parents are in denial and don't even want to acknowledge that they have a substance use 
problem, let alone actual addiction. And then nine months later, the um, that same person will end up being on long-term narcotics because they need them. And, and I think, you know, how do we go from this complete denial? And, and I'm just talking, you know, from family members standpoint, et cetera, to needing to be on narcotics. And, you know, there's this, because to me, there's a giant leap there. You know, and, and oftentimes that can happen in a very, very short period of time, you know, where an adolescent isn't even um, thought to of as like needing treatment. And then all of a sudden they're, they're needing to be on drugs. And, you know, the, the and granted 18 is when when adolescents turn into adults legally but there's a giant leap. And so I, I think there's a lot of uh, disconnects misunderstanding and quite frankly probably all, all the things that you see adolescents being in denial of i think societies are in denial of as well and parents and so understanding addiction and alcoholism as a potentially fatal disease i know it's like a uh, there's a lot of people that even cringe to that statement and but I, if we can go to this next slide real quick So, um, yes, such a vital understanding. Um, I'll, I'll just focus on sort of bullet one and three mostly here because Jason's really helped us with that morbidity and mortality piece. Um, as a parent, when you recognize that, um, when you really feel that in your bones, like you really know that to be true, you, you, that's when you are going to make sure, just like if you had a your child had a serious medical condition with morbidity and mortality associated with it, you would seek help for that. Um, understanding the science of addiction for families that the brain changes. Um, this is vital information for parents to have early so they do understand why they are not going to be able to control this all by parent, you know, you're just you're not going to be able to parent your way out of addiction and you don't realize you're really dealing with addiction number one and something that parenting standard parenting is not going to address. I totally agree that sometimes friends and families will downplay um, what's happening with a youth. Um, we hear a lot. Uh, oh, boys will be boys. Oh, she's a oppositional teenage girl. She'll grow out of it. Um, oh no, they're, you know, such a good kid. I know they're acting out now, but they'll be okay. There really is a lot of that. And it's, I'm sure very well intended to make a parent feel like, you know, you got this, you're okay. They're going to be okay. So many teens go through crazy times. It's so important for a parent to understand this is not normal teenage behavior that can run its course and just be parented. Um, that there's something happening here that uh, requires professional um, intervention and, and real ex knowledge and expertise around this. Um, so I, I think it's just really important to know that that's not doing people favors and that's what parents are around a lot. Next slide, Shannon. So, so this is one of the things that I just wanted to throw out there as uh, working with adolescents and also a, a variety of cl clinicians in, a, in different contexts with supervision, being a director previously, but there's, and managed care companies, insurance companies, hospital networks, um, you know, owners of treatment centers, People all look at this a little bit different, but I want to throw out there that a substance use disorder can be a primary diagnosis, just like a mental health disorder can. And you can have both of those happening at the same time. And I think a lot of times people get really caught up in uh, they're, they're using because of a mental health condition or, um, you know, if we can 
treat these symptoms so that the using is going to stop. And I, I just want to put out there that both of those can be primary issues that need primary attention at the same time. And um, one, one of the things I hear a lot with uh, parents, you know, when, when parents are undecided or not sure if their kids need treatment, is they're going through this denial and they're saying things like, well, I don't want, um, I don't want treatment to interfere with like their soccer, football, baseball practice after school. And usually if the adolescent is in the room and I, and I just ask them, are, are there times where you decide not to get high that day because you have soccer, football, baseball? And sometimes, the, it, it, you know, if they're honest about it, they'll say, yeah, maybe sometimes there are, but usually not. In other words, usually if they have an opportunity to get high, they're, they're getting high. And the idea of doing soccer, while everybody's all for doing soccer, is probably not going to just stop the use. Now, a lot of times people need to try that, and then they end up getting kicked off the soccer, football, baseball team anyway. Um, I've, I've certainly have seen that happen quite a bit. But this idea that, that the, the co-occurring disorders do happen at the same time is just something that I wanted to emphasize. And we can go to this next slide. I don't want to be the dead horse here. And um, this is our, actually our last slide, so we have plenty of time for questions. Um, but I just um, want to emphasize, in fact, I really just want to shout from the rooftops what Jason is speaking to in terms of co-occurring substance use, mental health issues, both must be considered primary diagnoses in order to get the treatment. Because from my lens in the family support world, as we help families get services within the mental health system, the mental health system to me is not recognizing the key role of substance abuse in these kids who are in their mental health system as well because they have anxiety and depression and they go off to treatments that are targeted at those only, assuming that those are gonna take care of the substance use. But what we're, we know and what Jason's been helping to um, bring out for us today is that we have to treat the substance use as a separate primary disorder. They will still potentially be dealing with substance use potentially for a very long time, even if they are getting anxiety, depression, things like that uh, more under control with treatment if the substance use is not being considered primary. So I feel like in terms of awareness, that is a huge message we can take out across Idaho, across all of our um, works and communities um, that, that's really a vital takeaway from today. Um, and I forgot to apologize earlier for having to shout for somebody to get the door because somebody was banging on my window right as I was trying to present. <laughs> so excuse me for that. And Shannon, at this point, um, we'll, we'll look for questions or comments. I'm going to throw one thing out there as well. The, this piece about the, the co-occurring and primary and secondary issues, obviously not every adolescent that's using has an addiction. So I'm definitely not saying that, but I am talking about the adolescents who do and who also happen to have other mental health disorders, which quite frankly happen all the time. I mean, it's pretty unusual that you see someone that feels good, is doing well, well adjusted, that just starts randomly getting high. And so you know, at the same time, I'm not trying to suggest that every single adolescent who's using has a primary substance use. Just wanted to put that out there. But we'd Thank love you. to hear some questions. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Ruth. Um, before we jump into questions, I wanted to just put out there that if you would like to receive Echo Idaho session reminders, um, Laura is going to put the link in the chat to register. So um, while we're still all on the call, I just wanted to put that announcement in. And also, if you haven't yet introduced yourself in the chat, if you could please do that. It looks like we have a lot of new people here um, at ECHO today. We want to make sure that we have you properly put into our system and um, have you in our attendance as well. So 
let's go ahead and open it up for questions for Ruth and Jason about family participation in adolescent sub treatment. All right, looks like we have our first question in the chat um, from Carrie Portales, who said, I thought I'd bring up two questions for two different groups. For probation on the call, what can providers do to help you with family engagement? And for providers, what can probation, so let's start with the providers one and then we'll go to probation. So um, to Jason, what can probation do to help you with family engagement for youth that are in the juvenile justice system? Well, that's a great question. I, I think having open dialogue is, is key. And quite frankly, I, I think usually uh, providers, and, and I don't want to speak for anybody in particular, but a lot of times people are just busy and they're probably not in communication as much as they should with these collateral programs like probation. And so I, I think having open lines of communication is important. Uh, what, one thing that I've noticed through doing like your analysis, drug testing as an agency, and then um, probation also doing drug testing, is sometimes those aren't shared in the here and now. Uh, in other words, if um, they're failing drug tests through probation as a provider, it would be great to know that. And then same thing if if adolescents are failing drug tests with us, it's obviously good to communicate that with probation. So I think having some kind of a system in place where it's, whether it's monthly, bi-weekly, or whatever the case may be, where information is being shared, progress status updates, that sort of thing. I know for me, I try to, um, you know, share really the black and white stuff. Like, are they showing up? Are they actively participating or passing drug tests? or not. And so keeping things simple for practitioners as well as for probation officers is, is a good idea, but that's a great question. I can um, throw in that we, my organization works with um, Idaho uh, Juvenile Corrections and probation. Um, and what we always suggest in terms of family engagement is uh, there is a message of the, the shame and blame message that I talked to earlier becomes very prevalent, especially when you're in a juvenile justice setting. Um, you you know your child has done something wrong. That's why you're there. It you feel the shame and blame of that. Um, so peer support in that environment can be so helpful if you can get families who have already gone through this. Um, the system, the, the court system, probation to help other families, that is really helpful because families will open up to other families with the same type of lived experience. Um, and then, uh, you know, referring people to organizations like ours, where they, it is a family organization and they are, they know, they just, they did just know from the start that they feel safer from judgment when they are with somebody who has been down that road. Thanks, Ruth. And the second half of that question from Carrie, um, what can providers, so this is for probation on the call. And uh, I don't know how many of you we have on this call, but Stephanie Phillips, I know you're on here. I don't know if I can call you out for this, but um, what can providers do to help you with family engagement? Hi, Shannon. Um, yeah, that is putting me on the spot. <laughs> you see a lot of new faces because I have invited like lots of my providers and I am seeing them. There's like 13 of them here. So, um, that's something that we are always looking at, you know, how can we beef up our family engagement? Um, so I love that Carrie, she kind of beat me to the question, um, but like Jason says, it is kind of like the million dollar question. <laughs> I wrote down the book that was suggested by Ruth, you know, the parallel, um, the parallel pro process. process. Thank you. Yes. Um, I don't know that I can honestly add anything just right this minute. Um, I'm sorry. I don't have anything right off the top of my head. 
Well, we appreciate you. And thanks for bringing a bunch of uh, newbies <laughs> to Echo. We love that. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Ryan. So I'm going to see if I can tackle this question, and it is the million dollar question. Um, there's so much in so many different settings, and there isn't just a right answer for that. I think at some point, and uh, as a psychiatrist, there's an opportunity to speak to this. There are certain there are certain processes, and it's hard because this isn't science. We haven't formalized it, but I think there's some sort of human common sense recognition that there's certain things that do not drive health, uh, shame, blame, um, judgment, emotional reactivity, you know, people are not like, oh, yeah, clearly, I should be doing more of that to create health. I think when I think about engagement, uh, I think of something that came from a mentor figure of mine. So it's not mine. But I really liked the idea of he talked about negative willpower and positive willpower and how this is so key in recovery. Um, any sort of addiction process, including behavioral addictions, if the goal is to try to not have something happen, there's this old, uh, and again, I mentioned it in the talk that I gave, I think it's Martin Boover. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember, but it's, it's a comedian sketch called Stop It. Uh, and it sort of makes fun of psychiatry. Um, and mental health, which is why I like it. There's some humor there. But I think at some point, the difficulty with where mental health is, is we still aren't super clear on the processes that create mental health. But we are becoming more clear about processes that create mental illness. And so if a family is engaging because of shame, fear, um, efforts to control things like that, then being able to speak to and normalize those things and help them in their own recovery journey and hopefully switching to something that is more of a positive willpower mindset, something that is creating rather than just trying to stop uh, a specific thing from happening. I think that can be really powerful for engagement. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, we've got time for probably one more question. And I see that Ruth too has uh, put the name of that book into the chat. And Laura also put the the EADS link again in there just in case anyone was having issues with the, the link for that. I think Dr. Billington was talking about an old Bob Newhart episode of the stop it if anybody's wondering but maybe there's another stop it no that is exactly it jason thank you so much yeah that is exactly it thank you bob newhart check it out it's funny and i think it'll drive the point home 